Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Environmental Science Video 5. It's on water resources. Our body is filled with over 60% water, and this doesn't seem like a big deal because the Earth is covered with over 70% water. The problem with that is that most of that is seawater that we can't use. And the fresh water that remains, most of it's going to be frozen in ice caps and glaciers. And so the percent that is really fresh water on the surface is a small percent of the water on our planet, and it's finite. The amount of water we have on our planet has never changed. Now as the Sun provides energy to the Earth, the water will move around through the hydrologic or the water cycle, but we have a finite amount of water and most of it is going to be seawater. We have a little bit of fresh water. The seawater moves around through ocean currents. The fresh water could be divided into groundwater, water underneath the surface, and then surface water which is on the surface. Now we need that water. We need it domestically in the home to take a shower or to drink, uh, but we also need it in industry to make our goods and most of it actually goes to agriculture to make the food that we eat. The problem with water on our planet is that it's unevenly distributed. In some areas there's lots of water, in some areas however there's going to be scarcity. And so humans have had to learn how to store water, move it around, and in the future we may have to desalinate some of that seawater so that we can use it as fresh water. Now where is that groundwater stored? It's underneath the ground in aquifers that we can deplete. What about the surface water? Well it can be stored in reservoirs that occur naturally or ones that are created as we produce dams. And then we can move it around through aqueducts and even to the plant itself through irrigation. But we have a finite amount and so conservation is incredibly important and economics have contributed to water loss and could help us to actually solve this water conservation problem. And so the hydrologic cycle works like this. Anywhere there's water on the surface we can have evaporation. That gets cooled and eventually leads to condensation and precipitation. Once it's on the surface we call that surface water. It's running over the surface. That could be lakes and swamps and rivers. After we have that water hit the ground, it can, however, be infiltrated into the soil and the ground itself. To give you an example of that, imagine I've got a beaker here. Is it full? Well, maybe full of air. If I put marbles in it, is it full? No, you can still see there's spaces in it. What if I fill it up with sand? Is it full? No, there's still spaces in there. If I fill it up with water, now we're starting to fill up that beaker. And that's what infiltration is. As the water flows down into the soil, we call that now groundwater. Let's say it's not filling that whole beaker, it's right here. That point at which we have saturation in the groundwater is called the water table. Most of our planet is covered with water. Unfortunately, it's seawater. It has salt dissolved in it. If you drink it, you'll die. If we, if we put it on our fields, the crops are going to die. Now, it moves around using currents. We talked about that in the lat last video on the atmosphere. It cells in the atmosphere and the Coriolis effect. So we have these general trends in circulation, but also salinity affects it. And so if we look at an area right here, it's a high salt concentration because we have a lot of evaporation. But up here, we have a lot of melting of that glacial ice and so we're gonna have a low salt concentration and so the salt concentration and differences in heat create these thermohaline circulation that really make that whole ocean on our planet one system. Now if we look at fresh water, it can be divided into water that is above the surface, we call that surface water, and then groundwater. But what's interesting is if we look to the sides of that stream, you can see the water table in the groundwater. And so if you dig a hole right here, it's just gonna fill in with water because of all that groundwater around it. Now this is an aquifer. It's storage of that water in the groundwater. We call this unconfined aquifer because the water can move between the surface and the aquifer itself. If I were to dig down a little bit we could find what's called a confined aquifer and that's going to be stuck between this impermeable rock down here and above it. Now let's say we want to get to that groundwater on the surface. If we want some of the surface water we simply pump it out of the stream but if we want to get out of that groundwater we could dig a well. Now the water we could either pump out the water or sometimes we'll have what's called an artesian well where there's either enough gravity above it or enough pressure in the ground water so it actually comes out. But as we use that well, just like using a stream, the water table is going to drop and so we're going to start to deplete that aquifer. Now an important term in filling an aquifer is something called recharge. So as we get water and infiltration, we're going to fill up that aquifer but if the outputs, in other words, if we pull out more water than we're putting in, we're going to deplete the aquifer. And what are we using all this fresh water for? Well, if we break it out using a pie chart, most of it is actually for agriculture, the growing of our food. We use some of it for industry. 
and then some of it domestically in the house. The problem again is that it's unevenly distributed on our planet. Brazil's gonna have plenty of water, but if we look in the desert southwest of the US or in the Sahara, there's not gonna be any water right there. And so what have humans done? We've started to store water. So reservoirs are an example of that. A big example would be the Three Gorges Dam that was built in China, finished in 2006. And so this is what that river, the Yangtze River looked like before they built the dam. And then they built the dam, it finished in 2006 you can see what it looks like then so we're storing the water behind the dam what's nice about that now we have water that we can use at will we also can get energy from it as we run that water through a generator we can control flooding downstream and also we can use that for irrigation or the three uh, three gorges dam they're using to increase shipping on the Yangtze River so it sounds great What's the problem? Well, there's going to be destruction wherever that water went. So we're decreasing 20% of the forest in this Yangtze River. We're uh, displacing over a million people that used to live there. We also have evaporation of the water off the surface. And then we're going to have nutrients that start to deposit there that would have normally moved their way down the river. And that's going to disrupt wildlife. And so fish obviously can't spawn, move up and down in the stream, but it's also going to change the temperature of the water. Example, there's a freshwater dolphin that went extinct in the Yangtze River, and the Three Gorges Dam may have contributed to that. We can also store it underground. That's naturally stored in what are called aquifers. One of the largest ones on the planet is the Ogallala Aquifer. It's going to be found in the Midwest. And so here it is in Nebraska, but it goes all the way down to Texas and up into South Dakota. It's a huge aquifer. So if we look at the amount of water stored under underground, it's over a thousand feet of infiltrated, saturated water underneath the ground that we can use. And you can see right here, there's tons of irrigation going on. This is in Kansas. They're using center pivot irrigation so they can grow their crops. Seems great, but what happens again is that we can deplete that. So if we look at this is during a 10 or a 15 year period of time. There's an increase in the aquifer in certain areas, but most of the time we're seeing depletion. And sometimes that aquifer has kind of disappeared. And a lot of scientists think in the next 100 years, the Ogallala aquifer is just going to disappear. Why is that a problem? It could take another 6,000 years to fill it up again through recharge, uh, natural recharge. Now we also have to move water around. So looking to California is a great example of that. So if we look in California, they need a lot of water in the Central Valley and then in the South, Los Angeles and San Diego. So they built this huge system where they can move water where it is in the mountains and they can move it through these aqueducts to where it's needed. Now you can see that's controversial. So people in this area are saying you're depleting our rivers. In this area, we're saying we have more population, we're growing your food, so we need more of that water. And this conversation becomes more heightened when we move into drought, and California is in an awful drought right now. Drought occurs when you receive way less than the normal amount of water. And so as we use that for agriculture, irrigation movement is super important. So how do we move the water actually to the plant? The easiest way to do that is using furrow irrigation. You can see it's easy, you just dig a trench. What's the problem? We have efficiency rates of around 60%. What's, what's that? It's how much of the water is actually going to the plant without being evaporated and infiltrated into the soil. So we could move to flood irrigation, higher efficiency, but it's going to damage the plant a lot of the time. We could move towards a spray irrigation, high efficiency, but what are we doing? You can see we're adding equipment. This is a center pivot, so that costs money. Or we could move to drip irrigation. You can see it's going to be 95% efficient, but it's going to cost the farmer a lot more money to do that kinds of irrigation. As we move into drought situations, desalination becomes an option. We can remove the water from seawater. One way to do this is through distillation. What you do is you heat up the water and it evaporates. It's kind of like the hydrologic cycle. You then cool it down, usually through pipes, and what you do is you remove the water. What's the problem? It costs a huge amount of money. We could also do that through reverse osmosis. This is a reverse osmosis plant over on the side. What you do is you put a membrane right here, and then we squeeze the water, and as you squeeze the water, you move the water through, but you leave the salts behind. Now we have fresh water. What's the problem? It costs a lot of money. About 1% of the people on our planet are using water that's created through desalination, but by 2025, we should have 14% of the people on our planet in water scarcity, and so desalination may be an issue. Now, how did we get to this problem? It seems like we have an unlimited amount of water, and remember our model that 
the earth provides the life support for society and the economy on the inside. And so the economy got us to this point. The decisions that we as governments made got us to this point. Where's the big mistake we made? Well, water doesn't cost enough. It's low cost water. In other words, governments are subsidizing the cost of water. So farmers and industry and you are not really paying the amount that water costs. And as a result, you're not going to conserve it because it's just pennies on the gallon. It's incredibly cheap. And so how could we solve this problem? People might not like it, but if we increase the price of water, people are going to start to conserve. And we can also use incentives. In other words, we can pay people to use, pay farmers, for example, to use irrigation that's going to be more efficient or to conserve water. That's another way that economics can start to solve this problem of water conservation. And so did you learn the following? I would pause the video at this point and try to fill in all the blanks. Thanks. But let me do that for you. Remember, the water resources move through the hydrologic cycle. We've got seawater. We've got uh, fresh water. Ocean circulation and desalination could help us solve this problem. The, the fresh water can be groundwater or surface water. We use it for domestic industry and agriculture would be what's here. We can store the surface water through reservoirs. Aquifers is groundwater. And then we're going to use aqueducts and irrigation to help us uh, move that water around. But again, conservation is incredibly important. Economics are going to drive that. And I hope that was helpful.